Now let me introduce our speaker for today, Asya Kamsky. Asya is a senior solution architect with Tengen, helping customers get the most out of their MongoDB deployments. She has over 20 years of industry experience, ranging from big companies like Cisco, GE, DEC, and Lawrence Berkeley Labs, to cutting edge startups like TGV Incorporated, eGreetings, Route Science, and Elementary Security. Her career has spanned work in database technology, security, software testing, networking, and the web. And with that, I will give the floor to Asya. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much, Shannon. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Today we're going to talk about NoSQL. Oh, I can barely hear you. Uh, today we're going to talk about NoSQL, what it is, um, how you might know whether you want to use it. And we'll take a close look specifically at MongoDB, which is one of the uh, so can you move the mic just a little bit closer? We're still having a tough time. Um, since we're having a technical problem, I'm speaking right into the mic. How's this? Better? Much better, yeah. It, it, well, the audience is saying no. No, okay. <laughs> problem. Maybe one second. Testing, testing, testing. How's this? Much better. Okay, I will I will speak up. All right. Okay. Uh, take, take two. Uh, <laughs> good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're here to talk about NoSQL, what it is how it works, why it is that you might want to consider it, and we'll take a closer look specifically at MongoDB, one of the leading NoSQL solutions. So a little bit of history. Uh, relational databases have been around since the 1970s, and things were very different back then. Uh, storage was expensive. Normalizing data conserved that storage. Uh, it also allowed abstracting the data layer from the application, which can be sometimes good, but sometimes can be not quite so good. And um, basically through the 80s, the databases became uh, incredibly popular. They were commercialized. There were a lot of vendors. We became familiar with the client-server model, where multiple clients could be interacting with the server. And SQL became the standard through which the applications could talk to the server. Are there still problems with the audio? I'm hearing you fine, but the audio is, is coming in a little poppy. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of um, participants comment that they can barely hear me. Um, yeah. Island. Please hold one second. Sure. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. We just want to make sure we get this set up. Testing, testing. Testing, testing, testing. That's much better. Audience, please comment. Uh, better, better. Excellent, but now, yep. Uh, my apologies. Uh, shall we start over? Sure. <laughs> Our apologies. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Asya Komsky, and we're going to talk about NoSQL databases today, how you might want to use them, what they are, and we'll take a closer look specifically at MongoDB, one of the leading non-relational databases. So a little bit of history. Uh, in the 1970s, when the relational database were first invented, storage was very expensive. Normalization of data acted both to uh, reduce the redundancy of data and also to abstract the data storage and the data structures away from the application. In the 1980s, we saw relational databases significantly uh, increase in use. The client-server model allowed many different applications to be querying against the database, and a standard language, a structured query language, was established that you could use to talk to actually multiple different databases. Things became 
quite different in the 90s. Uh, first of all, we saw the increase in the three-tier architecture where the light client talked to the application server, which talked to the database. But the rise of the internet and the web saw the scaling needs grow by orders of magnitude. Uh, that was the times when we learned to balance the web traffic with many, many, many web servers. And they may have been talking to multiple app servers, but all of them were talking to a single database in the back end. Now, in the 2000s, the problem continued to grow. A uh, rise of social media meant that there was less content that you could cache statically on the edges of the net because people were constantly tweeting and updating their statuses and um, changing their preferences in their friend um, networks. Uh, E-commerce has also become a lot more accepted and popular. Hardware has become cheaper and the amount of data, data that we're collecting grew tremendously. However, the database was still the single bottleneck in the back of all of these systems that collected this data, needed to update it, and needed to serve it up very, very fast. So we had a dramatic need to scale. The question is, uh, how do you scale the single bottleneck that's in the back of everything? So the database space back in you know the last decade essentially broke up into two distinct halves. You have the operational data store. Now, its strengths are it could handle complex transactions. It stored tabular data. It was very, very good at serving up ad hoc queries. However, the price was that the objects that the programmers viewed their data as did not map to these relational things very well. And that saw the rise of a lot of object relational uh, layers, management layers, and things that would map these things automatically without developers seeing them. Uh, it was not super agile. It was difficult generally to change the schema significantly if it was needed. And there were some speed and scale problems when you had to write a lot of data at the same time that you were reading it. For a completely different use case, we, we started seeing more different types of databases, mainly aimed at business intelligence and reporting. So they supported ad hoc queries still, and in fact, SQL was a standard protocol between all of the uh, reporting clients and the server. It scaled horizontally better than the operational databases. Uh, however, at massive amounts, we still saw quite a bit of uh, limitations. The schemas are rigid, so you, you pretty much have to know what it was you were going to be uh, asking questions about before design and implementation. And they didn't give you real-time data. They were great at bulk loading a large amount of data and then answering queries about the recent past. So good for analysis, uh, not so good for interactive type use. So not that many issues for the reporting and BI mostly satisfying the use cases that it was meant for. Um, but operational, there's major problems. So what were some of the solutions that were implemented from this? So the, uh, the map reduce, which is kind of where you chop up the problem and in parallel try to solve many parts of it and then merge back the answers, uh, was kind of a good batch level solution for the reporting in BI. The reply wouldn't necessarily come back right away, but it could handle a very massive amount of computations. On the OLTP side, uh, things were a little harder. There was a lot of layers that could improve performance. For example, you could cache a lot of your data in memory, specifically in the form that you needed it to reduce the number of queries that you'd have to run. Uh, some of the data would be stored in flat files so as not to overwhelm the relational storage. Um, you could do some partitioning of the operational data and handle that on the application level. Meanwhile, the developers saw an incredibly wide adoption of a methodology called Agile. So Agile does not actually cause shorter development cycles, nor does it cause the evolution of requirements. What it is, it was a response to the fact that 
the requirements were constantly evolving. With the internet time, people wanted to push changes to their sites every day, every couple of days. And you had to have flexibility at design time so that you would make it possible to make incremental changes and have very uh, quick releases in response to certain business needs. Now, as you might imagine, relational schema, and I imagine that most of you probably worked with relational databases, uh, they are hard to evolve. So if you make any changes, you would then need to have this massive database, which may have terabytes of data, go through a migration uh, in order to alter the structure of some of the relational tables. Now, the application changes have to stay exactly in sync because it's very difficult to maintain an application that understood two different views of the schema. Because of object relational layers, also fewer developers really understand what data is under the hood. So a lot of times when implementing their applications, they were not aware of the performance implications and um, how their program interacted with the data. All this made it very hard to scale. So this is roughly uh, how things might work. At the beginning of the project, everything is great. Then the performance starts suffering a little, so maybe the data model gets denormalized. And you stop using joins because you notice that there are these uh, queries that run forever that involve you know, 35 different tables. Uh, building a custom caching layer so you can run a query only once and then save the results for the application. And custom sharding, uh, sharding is just a different word for partitioning, uh, where you split up the data so that you can have multiple database servers handle as complex your application grows because you now have to know where to go for which data. Um, on the DBA side and the IT side, uh, the scaling might have been addressed by simply getting bigger servers. The problem with that is that you know a server that has four times the capacity usually costs a lot more than four times that of a smaller server. And eventually, that sort of thing would max out and you could not, in fact, grow beyond a certain point because simply the computers weren't built big enough to handle that. So the real need is for horizontal scaling. Now what is horizontal scaling? That's when you are able to linearly increase the capacity of the system by simply adding more machines. So if you're using commodity hardware, some sort of a Linux server, your average machine you might you know, have on your desk or even you know, in the server room, you would now be able to get maybe you know, 10 of those and have 10 times the throughput. 100 would give you another 10x improvement. There are more requirements for real-time queries. In other words, more data needs to be readable from your operational store in real time rather than waiting for some sort of an offline job to run to compute it. I already mentioned how agile and uh, very fast moving business requirements require simply faster development time, which usually requires a flexible data model. And of course, everybody wants low upfront costs and uh, low total cost of ownership. Uh, the main thing as far as capacity is also that applications simply don't have constant needs. Uh, some sites, maybe during uh, holidays, might have higher demand. Uh, new sites might have problems with demand during extremely important world events. Uh, increasingly, everybody wants high availability for both reads and writes. And also, if you can handle multi-data center distribution, it really helps with high availability. So in comes NoSQL, and what exactly is it? So I kind of put it into the DB space uh, circle in its own area. It tries to increase both speed and scale, but it, there's always trade-offs. So ad hoc query may be limited in a NoSQL solution or might not even exist. It's not very transactional. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about joins and transactions and how they interact with the ability to scale. So there's no standard for NoSQL. As you'll see, not only are there multiple different categories, but there's multiple vendors in each category. And of course, everyone has their own specific type of uh, thing that they do best. 
Now, a lot of it does fit object-oriented programming and design very, very well. And it tends to be really agile. So trading off some things in order to gain somewhere else. Now, in general, I'm going to call NoSQL uh, kind of an entire group of non-relational operation data stores or databases. So it encompasses collection of very different products. Pretty much all that they have in common is that they're not relational. They don't use structured query language for queries. Most of them don't have predefined schema or have some sort of a flexible schema. And some allow more rich data structures than others. But in general, they are not tabular. So in relational databases, we have relational. So that's uh, tables. Tables uh, have rows. Rows have columns. In general, you would expect all the values in the table to be populated. There are keys that refer to IDs in other tables. That's how they relate. That's why we call them relational. On the non-SQL non side, we have things like key value pairs. A key identifies a value or a set of values. Uh, a document, which may be a, a rich multiple key value pair combination. Uh, you can have XML document. Uh, graph databases are kind of a very specialized uh, use case. And some of you, they're not in the group of NoSQL, but they're definitely not relational and they address a different need. And column data stores, which can have a key that can have multiple column families defined for them. Traditionally, the uh, relational databases guarantee they have acid properties, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and uh, durability. Now, some of those are traded off in some of these NoSQL solutions. Uh, some of them are simply addressed differently or they happen on a different level. Uh, for example, um, on a relational database, you can atomically execute a number of operations. They will either all succeed or they will all fail. On the non-relational side, if you have a complex document with a large number of changes you need to make to it, you can do that atomically. Either all of the changes will land or none of them will land, but that's in the context of a single document. So that's a very different model. The other thing is in order to be able to be scalable and distributable across um, a large network and many, many hosts, a lot of them have traded off consistency for what's called eventual consistency. So the data will propagate to all the hosts, but not in real time. Now there's two-phase commit, that these transactions we're talking about, and the atomic transactions that can only happen at the document level on the non-SQL side. And the thing that actually allows the distribution is the fact that there are no joins on the NoSQL side. Now, the join is where you have data in two separate tables, and a single query relates the data together, maybe uh, update something based on values in the other one. When you distribute the data across multiple hosts, at some point you have to give up on the idea that you are willing to wait if you know, data that's in two separate locations is not available at the same time. Maybe there's network uh, lag, and maybe uh, just uh, you know, bad latency, or maybe some hosts uh, have come down and you won't hear from it, holding a lot and uh, holding many records and invisible to the rest of the system state makes the system completely not scalable. And so there's very different semantics on the NoSQL side. So it's a distributed and fault tolerant architecture, but it does not give acid guarantees. So there are a lot of players in the NoSQL land. Um, kind of the, in, in terms of the root of the, the movement is, you know, before there were NoSQL products, many companies had extremely uh, large amounts of data that they needed to deal with. Uh, as you might imagine, um, uh, Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, LinkedIn, Yahoo, and each one of them essentially wrote their own solution. And Eventually, all of them had published, uh, open sourced the code, published papers describing it. 
it, it's kind of great that these solutions have been productized for people because if you are a small company but you're hoping to grow, maybe not to be the size of Amazon, maybe only one-tenth of Amazon, which is pretty big, um, you don't have the resources to write your own caching layer, to write your own custom NoSQL layer, but you have the ability to take this open source program and start using it. And hopefully you will actually need that level of scalability if you're super successful. So um, kind of these, these are rough groupings, uh, the key value stores, uh, most of them are originally based on either the Peanuts uh, paper by Yahoo or DynamoDB, which is developed by Amazon. There's columnar stores like Cassandra and HBase, um, Graph Database, and Document Databases, uh, of which MongoDB is one. Now, there are a lot of different things you might want to look at um, to decide whether or not you need NoSQL. And if you're currently using a relational database and you're not having any problems mapping your data to it and not having any scalability problems, I, I'm not really sure that you, know, you need to rock your boat and jump on NoSQL because everybody says it's the coolest, latest thing. However, a lot of people actually have trouble mapping their data to relational tables. The data doesn't appear to be relational, or they start seeing very quickly some scalability problems based on the type of usage patterns that they know they will have. So you definitely need to look at the type of reads and the type of writes, the type of queries your application has. Um, you want to look and see how easy it's going to be to maintain or to scale the solution that you pick, uh, how easy it'll be to use, how long it'll take you to come up to speed on it. And then there's all these other things like scalability and cost and things like that. So um, let's take a look at some closer detail on how MongoDB deals with a lot of these issues that I mentioned in general problem. So a little bit on MongoDB history. So the founders of MongoDB, so one of them was one of the co-founders of DoubleClick, which I'm sure many of you heard about. I was serving up lots and lots of ads in the late 90s and early 2000s until it was bought by Google. And so now it's serving up lots and lots of ads uh, as part of Google uh, to the point of having to handle over 400,000 ads per second which was uh, pretty challenging. And the founder um, started another company, Guild Group, and uh, a coworker who was from DoubleClick started ShopWiki or a few others. And they constantly ran against the same problem, which is it was easy to scale the web traffic and the application, but it was very hard to scale the database. So they start, set out from the start to build the type of database, the type of data store that they wanted to have when they were developing these types of applications. And then what happened was, um, well, they actually started developing it as part of an, uh, an app platform. And people weren't that interested in the app platform, but they were very interested in the database. So they open sourced the database. So it is available. You can just download it and try it, no cost. And it's been um, released and in production in some sites for a number of years now. So its design goals kind of can be summarized like this. Key value stores that are in memory are very, very fast, and they trade off a lot of the rich functionality that our DBMS has had. And they wanted to design MongoDB keeping as many important features of RDBMS as they could, while at the same time having the scalability and performance be as close as possible to the in-memory key value stores. So this is kind of what they came up with. It's a documented-oriented storage, so what is stored, the records, are JSON documents. They're actually stored as BSON, which is a binary form of JSON. It's a bit richer and has more data types that it supports, but you can think of it as JSON documents. The schema is flexible. A lot of times people will say schema-free, uh, which I, I'm not sure I like as much. The, the schema is not enforced. So different records, different documents can have different fields. If a particular field is not applicable, it doesn't have to be set. If its type is different based on the type of object that you're storing, then you would store different types. 
makes it quite flexible for the developer. Scalable architecture, there's two things, and I'll talk about both of them in a lot more detail. One is auto sharding, which is partitioning automatically with minimal um, effort or knowledge from the um, maintainers, and replication for high availability. Some of the features that they wanted to keep from RDBMS is um, indexes that can make the ad hoc queries fast, have a rich and expressive query language, and be able to uh, answer more complex questions through the aggregation framework and through map reduce jobs. So what are JSON documents? Um, a lot of them might be familiar um, with it, with them because they're quite common, especially if you're developing for the web. They also natively map to a lot of different programming languages, and very flexible. And I'll show you how they provide better data locality as well. So if we take a, take a look at an example of something like a blog post. So a blog post might be um, represented relationally with a table of authors or people. Um, they have posts. Looks like I'm missing a line there. Uh, posts can have comments. Authors can also have comments. Um, posts can be tagged based on what they are about, so there can be many, many relationships between posts and tags. And let's take a look at what that would look like as a JSON document. So JSON document, for those of you who are not familiar with them, you can think of it essentially as a, a set of key value pairs where the value is not limited to be a simple value. It could also be an array of values. So for example, we might add tags as an array, and that array will have a bunch of simple values, which is strings. Now if we want to find all the posts that have the tag news, you would just say db.post, that's the name of my collection, find and then pass it a JSON document that says tags should be equal to news. And it's going to return to me all the posts that were tagged with news. Now we might also want to keep track of voting. And since we might want to query and sort by the number of votes, at the same time that we add voters, we might also want to atomically update the counter of voters so we don't have to do complex calculations later. Kind of in a way pre-calculating that value because we know that we're going to need it. And we could embed comments right there in the post itself. So each comment, you can see it's an array, actually is a document on its own. So each member of the comments array shows who it's by, and then the text. Now, it might have other fields, but for simplicity, I'm showing just this. The nice thing is not only can we have an index on any secondary field like author or tags, but we can also have an index on embedded documents. And we could search, for example, all comments by a particular author and use an index and be able to find that very quickly. So this preserves some of the expectations and some of the functionalities that people are used to from their database works with relational databases, but it allows them to create much richer, more complex documents that contains within it all the data that's associated with it. Now, why might that be advantageous? So when data is stored on disk, to the place where the data lives is, is quite expensive compared to the actual reading of the data. This is why solid state drives, for example, are so much more expensive and uh, so much faster than your regular spinning drives. And spinning drives that have slow spinning speed are particularly bad. So here you have three tables. You've got your authors, your posts, your comments. And you have to seek to all the different places, find the appropriate records that are being queried, queried for, gather them together, assemble them in that join, and then return them. What happens when it's all stored as a document is well, you find the data and you return all of the data that needs to be returned. That's when you are saving, when you are writing a new uh, post for an author, you do the right only once, rather than entering things in a number of different things. 
So MongoDB is actually meant to be a general purpose database with uh, complex and uh, dynamic queries that you can construct, uh, secondary indexes, and various other types of indexes like multi-key indexes on arrays, uh, 2D indexes for spatial queries, and um, very rich capacity around updates and upserts. And by the way, upsert is a um, an operation where you say, uh, insert this record. If it's already there, then update it. If it's not there, then insert. It's kind of a cross between an insert and an update. Uh, you can update documents atomically. For example, adding a new voter to a record and at the same time uh, incrementing the count of voters, making sure that those, of course, then have to be in sync. Uh, you can aggregate data from various types of reporting. You can write fairly arbitrary map reduce jobs. So it kind of makes it viable as your primary data store. You scale. Scaling is quite important. Uh, you want to have high availability. You want to be able to scale linearly. You want to be able to do all that without downtime. And the other very important thing is the application should not have to be changed when you change the number of servers you have or how you've configured your cluster. So first I'm going to address high availability. And uh, MongoDB deals with that with what we call replica sets. So replica sets is a set of servers of which one is a primary, the rest are all secondaries. It has properties of automatic failover on failure of a primary. It provides you with data redundancy with uh, extra copies of the data for disaster recovery. It does it in a way that's transparent to the application, which also allows you to perform maintenance with no downtime. Since you can perform maintenance on one of the secondaries, then put it back in the cluster, perform maintenance on another, put it back in the cluster, and eventually switch the primary over to one of the secondaries so this, the primary can have the same maintenance done on it. So it looks something like this. You have a primary and two secondaries, and you could have seven secondaries or 11 secondaries. Uh, three is generally a, a good minimum to have. You have asynchronous replication that's happening from the primary to all the secondaries. Your application, which is talking through its driver, which is a, a native interface for the application, and the drivers all know how to talk to the replica set, the write and the reads by default all go to the primary. So the writes have to go to the primary, and they will be replicated to the secondaries. The reads by default will go to the primary. Now, your application can specify that it's okay reading from a secondary. Uh, for example, it's uh, querying for you know yesterday's data or, or historical data. So you can explicitly specify that you're okay reading from a secondary, but it would never happen without your knowledge. Now what happens if a primary fails? So as soon as the secondaries notice that um, the primary is not responding, an automatic election happens, and a new primary is elected. It would be the one that's most up-to-date, and there's ways in configuration that you can influence uh, which one you know, should have a preference during the election. Now the driver, which is keeping track of the replica set configuration, will switch over now to writing and reading to the new primary, with the other secondary continuing to serve as a secondary. If the original primary now comes back online, for example, maybe it was a network uh, that had gone uh, disconnected or the machine crashed and now was brought back up okay, it now catches up as a member of the replica set as a secondary. When it catches up, depending on you know whether it has a higher priority than the machine that's currently serving as a primary, it could force a new election and become a primary again or the whole replica set could stay in this configuration until something else happens to say the new primary. All of this is kind of transparent to the application. Now, how do you increase capacity? Because as you could see, you could add more numbers to the replica set, but it doesn't really uh, increase capacity except in a limited way it can increase your read capacity. Uh, and it certainly will um, assure more high availability. But what about write scaling? And we want to do it in a way that's transparent to the application, simply for simplicity of development and ease of administration. 
So MongoDB uses range-based partitioning. Now, the splitting up of data into partitions and balancing it between the servers, or shards as we call them, because this is a sharding system, uh, it's automatic. It happens something like this. So let's say um, you have a fairly big server. You say, you know what, it's time to shard this. I'm going to get more machines provisioned. I'm going to add them to my sharding cluster. And you have to pick a, a key. And just for simplicity, let's just say it's some key range, you know, 0 to 100. In reality, you would make it something different depending on the needs of the application because you want to make sure that the writes are distributed equally among the separate shards and you want to make sure that the leads are also happening efficiently. So I'm going to use as an example some sort of a key. You have a range of 0 to 100. The partitioning happens under the hood automatically. Let's say maybe you created four shards in the cluster. Eventually, when enough data shows up, all the key ranges will get split up approximately evenly, and the data gets balanced between the servers. Now, how is this invisible to the application? By the way, each shard would be a replica set. It wouldn't be a single server, because you want to make sure you have high availability for every partition of your data. So the application actually talks to a process, uh, which is the sharding router process. We call it Mongo S, as opposed to Mongo D, which is the Mongo uh, standalone database process. To the application, Mongo S looks and talks just like a regular Mongo D standalone server. So application is just sending its queries to Mongo S. Now under the hood, Mongo S is figuring out where to send each query or each write to which shard. If it's something that goes to multiple shards, then Mongo S gets back multiple results, merges them together, and sends them back to the application. And now the application didn't have to be changed at all, but now you're essentially quadrupling your capacity this way. Now, Mongo S is a very lightweight process, and you would actually have as many of them as you have app servers, maybe, because each app server could have its own. It's just a, something that knows how to route requests based on knowing where the data is on each shard. Now, how does each Mongo S know where the data is? Well, they use these config servers, and the config servers, and you would have to have three of them to make sure that you always had availability in case one of them failed or even two of them failed in most case. Config server is where the metadata lives that maps the location of the data to which shard, which chunk and which shard it's on. And this is also the database that keeps track of different chunks of data moving from one shard to another. And the reason you can have many, many Mongo S routing processes is because each of them just checked with the config server. Hey, where's this data? Where's this key range that I need? Uh, where should this data come from? Et cetera. So you might imagine that um, you're running with four shards and successfully doing really great, and suddenly you have a big spike in demand. Maybe uh, you released some cool new version. All you have to do is provision some additional servers, create new shards, add them to your cluster, and automatically the data will get distributed from these four shards onto the additional shards to distribute the load more evenly. So management is, is really quite straightforward. The goal of the original design was to have as few configuration options as possible, to let the operating system to do as much of the RAM and disk space management to have the right thing mostly happen out of the box that you would only need to tweak occasionally and to make it very easy to deploy and to manage. And of course to developers it's easier to use because it maps more naturally onto the data that they're dealing with. Right? If you have a, a contact and it has two email addresses Right. You might start a transaction, enter something into the contact table, then enter a couple of entries into the uh, emails table. And in MongoDB, that's a single document that you save once. That save is atomic, so you don't have to worry about starting and ending transaction because only some of the rows might get written. And kind of simplifying things significantly. 
Now, because they're native drivers for dozens of languages, uh, the users don't actually have to learn any kind of new querying language, any new uh, database language. They are simply using the language that they are already used to uh, using, whether it be Java or C Sharp or Python, PHP, Ruby, etc. Now, some usage examples from real life. Uh, MongoDB, of course, can be used for many different use cases. Um, we have examples, customers using it for content management, uh, operational intelligence, e-commerce, managing management of user data, high volume data feeds. What I have is uh, three different examples. One is WordNick. So, they have a massive amount of data, and it might be a lot more now, actually. I'm, I'm not sure how up to date this slide is. But they have something like 3.5 terabytes of data in 20 billion records. And their problem was that they were trying to analyze a, a really staggering amount of data. And adding data too quickly resulted in outages. Uh, because of the way that relational database spreads the data across multiple tables, it really uh, doesn't scale that well when you have a lot of writes coming in at the same time that you're trying to do reads. And uh, even though initially they launched and were okay on uh, MySQL, they quickly hit some performance roadblocks. They picked Mongo, um, and as a result, they were able to eliminate the memcached D layer, so they had been caching a lot of the records to avoid hitting the database for leads. Uh, they were able to migrate 5 billion records in a day with no downtime. And now MongoDB powers every one of their website requests, which is something like 20 million API calls per day. One of the nice side effects they told us was that they were able to reduce the total size of their code base significantly compared to MySQL. Now, part of it is because of the native drivers and the, the no need for extra layers of translating relational data to objects. Part of it is because they no longer had a need to have an extra memcached layer. Their fetch time went down from 400 milliseconds to 60 milliseconds. And they were able to sustain insert speed of up to 8,000 words per second, actually frequent bursts as high as 50,000 words per second. And um, this was also significant cost savings for them because they were able to um, essentially process the same or larger capacity uh, with fewer servers. And um, nice quote from uh, VP of Engineering there. Now into it. Um, now I know a lot of people know, you know, Intuit has, you know, uh, Quicken and QuickBooks, and I use Quicken myself. But and they also host uh, something like half a million websites for small businesses, and they wanted to be able to collect and analyze data. But um, in general, it would take days to process the information to get answers to just even simple queries. They decided that they wanted to be able to use MongoDB ad hoc queries and MapReduce jobs to simplify and get better performance than what they currently have, but they felt like it would be less effort than um, deploying a complex Hadoop uh, cluster. And part of the reason they picked MongoDB is because of the strength of the community. There's a very large and active community using MongoDB and um, very active mailing lists, answering questions from users. The developers are very active on it as well. Uh, it turns out they were able to prototype the whole system within one week. They were able to become proficient in MongoDB, did a functioning prototype, and feel like they could see exactly how the whole system would work. And they simply picked it based on how quickly they were able to turn this around. In addition, the result was two and a half times faster for them than the original implementation of MySQL. Now Shutterfly, I don't know how many of you uh, use it, they store a lot of photographs for their users. Something like 20 terabytes of data, 6 billion images for millions of customers, and partitioning them by function. Now they used to have a homegrown key value store, an in-memory key value store on top of the Oracle database, but they were still getting poor performance. It was also hard to manage and it had high licensing costs and uh, rather high hardware costs as well. 
And they picked MongoDB for a few reasons. One was the JSON-based data structure was rich and allowed providing very complex data structures that represented their use case very well. Uh, they felt that it was a very agile and high-performing solution that had a low cost. And it worked very seamlessly with the existing services-based architecture. Uh, they achieved pretty significant cost and uh, perform reductions and performance improvements. Um, maybe even more importantly to a lot of people, they really were able to accelerate the time to market for a lot of projects when it just simply be became easier for the projects to access data and be able to um, flexibly uh, adjust the schema as it was needed for them. And the latency for inserts went down from 400 milliseconds to 2 milliseconds, which is pretty significant. And um, you know, a quote from them saying, in fact, that it was the rich JSON-based data structure that offered them um, a way that was extremely agile for development. There's thousands of other organizations using MongoDB. Um, maybe you're one of them and styling to see what was up. Um, and if not, maybe you're considering looking at it. So um, hopefully this was useful information for you. And we're going to see if there's any questions. Hopefully you've been either typing in questions into the public chat. Or if you wanted to send a private note directly to me or to Shannon, the moderator, you can do so as well. And she will relay them to me. I'm going to take a second now to give you a chance to type in your questions. Okay, I see a few pretty good questions. So uh, one of them asks about best practices about when to start sharding. So how do you know if you can make it with a single cluster or if you should straight off shard? Now it's definitely true that it's much easier to shard an over-provisioned system, in other words, a system that has a bit of room to grow still, than to wait until you absolutely need to shard and then start it. And the reason might seem pretty obvious to, to you if you think about it. Um, when your system is already overloaded, can you start the process of partitioning and migrating the data? Migrating data requires reading about half of your data, granted, you know, one chunk at a time, and moving the data, competing for the resources that are already very, very stretched. So I would say if you have a system that's, up, you know, about loaded to 50% pretty constantly, it's probably a really good time to, you know, hurry up and figure out that you want to shard. Because once you're past, you know, about a 70, 75% point, you simply don't have as much headroom left in order to be able to painlessly um, add more. And this is specifically going from, you know, essentially one shard or no shard to two. Um, if you have, you know, six or seven shards adding one or two more, it's not going to be nearly as much of a stress because generally that will be spread across the existing shards already. Now, um, we have a question about how do you know that no SQL would be a better approach than relational SQL approach, I assume, based on your application. So that's, that's a really good question. You know, if you have an existing application and you already have to denormalize the data or build a custom caching layer or do some sort of custom partitioning, that's, that's a pretty obvious uh, symptom that you should be considering a different data model. But what if it's a new application and you actually don't know yet whether you would run into any of these difficulties? So I would say, first of all, look at data modeling. Look at the type of queries, the type of data that you're going to be storing and how you're going to be querying it, and see if it maps really easily or well to a relational schema. If it does, it's probably a really good fit for relational. If it doesn't, if you have either really um, very varied data or the type of data structures that you know, really resemble more of a JSON document that they do with tabular data, then probably you want to consider both. Uh, if you can't even figure out how to map your data to a relational structure, then um, I guess you're definitely a strong candidate for uh, considering an OSQL solution. 
Alrighty. Um, what cases would RGBMS be better than MongoDB? Well, um, I'd say, first of all, you know, if the nature of the data is relational and naturally the application would take advantage of a lot of the relational database capabilities such as uh, transactions, a two-phase commit. If you have two unrelated operations that must happen in a way that would um, assure that either both of them happen or neither one of them happens. That's a very kind of a relational thing to do, right? Financial transactions sometimes call for those kind of semantics. If you use, let's say, MongoDB in that case, you would have to essentially do all that work yourself on the application level. So just like you don't want to do on the application level what MongoDB can kind of give you for free, you don't want to do on the application level what a database can give you for free. So look at the capabilities that fit your application needs and see where the balance falls. Uh, Alrighty, so, wow, there's uh, lots and lots of questions. Yeah, so there's a good question about um, how do you migrate if you're currently on a relational database and you want to go to Mongo? And uh, you definitely don't go one table to one collection. In fact, I would say probably approach the migration as if you had a brand new design and look at your application code and see what data structures, what objects in your application code you would want to store as single objects. And then after you kind of get a picture from that, see how they are currently stored in the relational database. It may very well be that you'll end up changing the structure so significantly that it would be hard to see uh, kind of a natural mapping. Uh, like in an example that I showed where you want to store blog posts with the authors and the comments and the tags all embedded, how would you map the comments table or the tags table? The tags table wouldn't really exist. A lot of times in relational databases, you have tables for concepts that don't actually exist on their own, right? Tags don't exist except as attributes of blog posts. Line items on orders don't really exist. There's no such thing that you can look at and hold in your hand called a um, line item. It's just a property or an attribute of um, an order, and so it would be an array of these things on your order object, even though they're stored in a separate table on in the relational database. Um, so the question about uh, data encryption and decryption uh, by the database, I I'm not sure. Well, so um, actually, the uh, data encryption at rest in general would be handled by the file system rather than by uh, Mongo. Hopefully that helps. If not, uh, drop us an email and give you more information about that. Ah, okay. So here's an interesting question. So somebody has a collection and there's a key on that collection that can only have one of two values, either one or zero. It's indexed. When you query on that column, the performance is very slow. Now, this is something that's not in any way specific to Mongo or, not, or no SQL databases. You would see pretty much exactly the same thing in a relational database. Uh, when the key selectivity is very low, and I know we didn't have time to get into the details of how indexes are implemented, but MongoDB implements the exact same data structure that pretty much all relational databases use, which is the B tree. And the more values there are, the more distinct values you're indexing, the better the performance gain when you're only selecting a subset of those values. Now, if you have 3 million records and half of them are 0 and half of them are 1, you say, I only want the ones where that value is 1, you're still looking at 1.5 million records. You wouldn't really expect the performance improvement to be that much better than a complete and full table scan. So in general, you need to take about the same care when designing your indexes in Mongo, whether they're compound indexes or multi-key indexes, as you do in a relational database, which is make sure that the index is helpful in the type of queries you'll be doing. 
And you don't want to just arbitrarily throw in lots of indexes because, of course, when inserting new records or updated data, the maintenance of indexes still has to be taken care of. Here's a question I'm not quite sure how uh, to interpret. How can MongoDB ensure data quality? So MongoDB cannot ensure data quality in the sense that if your application writes incorrect data or data that's not uh, appropriate to what it was supposed to do into MongoDB, MongoDB wouldn't know anything about that. So it does shift the logic, a lot of it, onto the application layer. Now, some people still choose to use an object relational layer between their code and MongoDB. And it's precisely for that reason. They want to have a layer where they define the data model that will enforce and prevent an application that's the wrong version or has a bug in it from being able to push incorrect data into the database. Hopefully that's kind of what you meant. There's a couple of questions about the Foursquare outage, which was quite a while ago. I don't really want to go into too much detail about it because you can kind of Google um, on the net and find lots and lots of discussions. But uh, I believe one of the root causes was very much related to the question about when to go to sharding, where um, if you are in a situation where the you're already at nearly maximum capacity, then spreading the load to a new machine is going to basically fill that available capacity and um, cause that machine to be very non-responsive both to the migration and to the existing queries. So that, is there any documentation on good practices to implementing sharding? Fast, simple, and right the first time from the beginning to ease scaling. So there's definitely a lot of documentation. There is, um, well, obviously there's the manual. Um, there's a lot of write-ups in the community about people's experiences. There's a, a pretty good book called um, Scaling MongoDB, which is all about sharding. Um, and I think in general, if you approach the problem Keeping in mind things like, you know, how the scaling will benefit you, um, what your needs are in terms of what kind of rights you will have, specifically thinking about the peak times, right? Because a system that's available most of the time that falls over during the worst peak times for you is not a very good system. You want to make sure that it's the peaks that you can accommodate. Uh, there's a question about whether um, a deadlock can occur during write operation. Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, generally, a deadlock can only occur if you have two threads, each of which is holding a lock, and you think of a lock that the other one has. And um, we don't have anything that holds, that requires multiple locks that holds one lock while waiting for another. This is actually a situation that's kind of unique to a system like a relational database where multiple locks can be needed in order to complete a transaction. For example, if you're writing to two separate tables, you would need a lock on a row in one and a lock on a row in the other one. And you may be waiting for that one while a different transaction is executing the same update in different order or a similar update. So because the lock only happens on a single document, either you acquire it and complete the transaction, that single update atomically of a single document, or you don't. If you don't acquire the lock, you wait for it, and when the process that does complete it releases it, then you acquire it. So that pretty much makes it um, you know, immune to that kind of a uh, you know, distributed multiple lock problem. Alrighty, we are pretty much out of time. I'll look for um, maybe one or two more quick questions. Um, yeah, we're right at the top of the hour, Asya. So actually, I'm going to cut you off there. And, and thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. And thank you, everybody, for your patience with the sound and, and glad that it was coming through. Um, so and we'll get the, just to remind everyone, we will get the links to the recording and links to the slide within two business days. And uh, Asya, you mentioned a book that um, would be helpful. Maybe we can get that in the follow-up email as well. 
um, and get the, any information out to everybody. Thank you very much, everyone. So thank you, and thanks everyone, and have a great day. Again, thanks for your patience with the sound, and, and glad we got things working, and um, again, we'll get things out to you as soon as possible. Have a great day. Bye-bye. All conference hosts have hung up. This conference is over. Thank you.